Man, what is up? What is up? You already know what it is, man. Welcome to another episode of the Vance Barnes Pod. I am him. He is me, Glitching Matrix, your host, Vance Barnes. Man, appreciate y'all tapping in. Episode 56. I'm back. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, please go share with your moms, grandmas, friends, aunties, all that good stuff, man. Appreciate y'all tapping in. Be wearing a hat knees because I ain't got no cut in a while. Y'all know how it is when you ain't got no cut in a minute. It'd be rough. It'd be rough, man. So appreciate y'all tapping in with me. Got a couple topics we finna talk talk about today. Not our usual. It's not gonna be our usual educational, um, not even educational, like what's self improvement pod, man. It's going talking about some some fun stuff, man. Some some Life and sports, we're going to dive into the sports world on this one, man, because I think it, a lot of great things have, a lot of great conversations come out of things uh, that happen within our reality, within sports, and I think it's great to have these conversations so that you can be able to take, you know, just like learn. Like we talk about all the time, like sometimes if you just don't know, you just don't know, and it's okay to be like, whatever topic it is, whether your boys are talking about something, your girls are talking about something. You should be like, man, I don't know enough on that topic to speak on it. But then in taking it and ingesting it, it's like you just learn. And then you're able to form your own opinions. And we talk about that all the time in the podcast. It's like being able to form your own opinions um, and not just going with what the masses are saying or what anybody else is saying, right? Um, so first in the podcast, man, I want to talk about Coach Prime, man. Neon Dion, one of the best players ever to me. The best corner DB to ever do it, play in the NFL. Um, you know, Coach Prime. Like I said, one of, it, Hall of Famer, but the best co- corner in my in my opinion to ever play, and he really revolutionized like how DBs got paid and how they got marketed. Like he brought marketing. Just to give you guys a background for the listeners that don't know a lot about Deion Sanders, is he was like the first corner one of the first defensive players to be like, I'm going to market and brand myself. And he's a two sport athlete. Um, like you, there's Bo Jackson, there's Dion, right there. Talk about athletic freak, man. This guy played in the NFL and at the MLB at the same time, right? Professional football, professional baseball at a very high level. Wasn't just a scrub neither. Like he was doing it at a high level, played in a, in a world series, I believe, um, won multiple Super Bowls. But man, yeah, he's the goat. He's the goat. Um, he gets. He's been coaching high school football for a while, and then goes to Jackson State. And we're gonna get into all this. I'm not just rushing through it. We're gonna get into all of it. But um, and by the way, I, I'm I'm not a Bulls fan. I just like the hat, man. I just like that. I just like the hat for y'all that's watching on YouTube. I am not a Bulls fan. My dad is from Chicago. He's a diehard Bulls fan. Jordan, all the way. Sadly. I am a T Wolves fan. We're not gonna talk about that right now. We're not gonna talk about that right now. But back on Coach Prime, man. So Coach Prime just got accepted, or he just accepted the job at uh University of Colorado. I think they went like one and eleven, one and ten this year, so they they're horrendous. Really bad. And this has been a huge topic, especially within the black community on this week and in sports because coach prime recently coached at jackson state at the hbcu right historically black college university and to give some background on hbcus right let's give some background on hbcus hbcus have been extremely underfunded for years right um i don't know if it's alumni not giving back if it's just them not getting support from the state um from the school from the communities, whatever it is, HBCUs have been underfunded. Uh, they've been looked at as like little brother universities, um, not only in athletics, but in just life. I don't know how much an HBCU degree, how far that goes um, in certain careers. But just to give you a little bit of background on that, I just like, like for instance, Howard University, I remember they had that thing uh, either last year, a couple years back, either before COVID or after COVID, but still, where they did not, like their dorms, 
did not have clean water for a while, right? And I remember that whole thing of um, them going through it, not having clean water, and it was just a disaster. And I kind of look at it, me, first college I went to was St. Cloud State University. St. Cloud State University is a university that was at one time the second biggest university in the state of Minnesota, right after the University of Minnesota. Um, St. Cloud State was a promising university in athletics. It was, you know, people wanted to go there. It's only an hour from the city. So it was like University of Minnesota and it was Mankato St. Cloud, right? The two division two schools, big schools um, that were an hour away from the cities, you know, and it was a great thriving university somewhere along the line before I got there. Shortly before I got there, um, some new positions got taken over as far as administration within the school. And it just went down, right? It just went extremely down. And I say that, I bring that up to be to say that they ended up making my freshman year making budget cuts. And that's one of the first reasons I, t I transferred. And we will get into that stuff later, talking about the portal. But... I remember them us bringing all of us athletes into the gym or into the auditorium one Wednesday and being like, yo, we're making cuts. Um, this is long story short, obviously. And then they were just like, we're gonna be making some budget cuts here in the, like the list of sports that we will be cutting and men's track and field being one of them, the, one of the sports I participated in. And I just remember like getting there and you don't realize it till you were out of it. But I'm like, man, so you go to something better, right? And you're like, wow, we really didn't have a lot of money. Like I remember getting there and all the clothes that we got for football, we had to give back at the end of the season. Like we didn't get to keep any of it. Uh, we didn't really get a lot of new stuff, new clothes. Um, this, the, the campus looked dry all the time. There, you weren't, you didn't see a lot of people outside the athletes. Um, it was bad. And that university is going, is going down, right? I talk about that because the HBCUs, I kind of think there's some similarities to that, right? There's, you know, I'm guessing you go on some of these HBCUs and they just look dead, right? They're extremely underfunded. Their facilities are terrible. Um, that was the state that these universities were in before, long before Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, took over as the head coach at Jackson State. So, Getting back on Coach Prime, Coach Prime wanted to, like I said, he was coaching high school football. He was coaching his sons, and he wanted to get into college coaching and coach at his alma mater, Florida State University. That He, he came out and he said that years ago, but FSU wouldn't take it because of his lack of experience, right? So, you know, he decided to go to Jackson State. And I think one of the, this is where people are, I can see why they're upset now is because he decides to go to Jackson State and he starts preaching this stuff about turning around the look of HBCUs and restoring them, right? Restoring and giving new life to historically black universities and changing the outlook of them. So, in Coach Prime's time there, right? He spent three seasons there, kind of two and a half because COVID season was shortened. Um, in, two, in 2021, they go 11 and two, they win a conference title. In 2022, they go 12 and 0, winning a conference title. This last year, they still got a bowl game left, right? So in two and a half years, basically, Coach Prime has a 27 and five record with two conference titles. And like anybody else in any other profession, it's time to level up, right? It's time to, it's time to move on. He gets the number one recruit in Travis Hunter to go there. I'm talking about the number one recruit in the nation over Bama, LSU, Georgia, Ohio State. Like he gets him to go to Jackson State. That's big time, man. You get the number one football player in America, high school kid, to go to your school. That's huge. Um, his son, Shador, I believe, yeah, is one of the best quarterbacks in the country would have been a Heisman candidate if he didn't go to Jackson State. Like if he put up the numbers he did at any other big time school going 12-0, um, he damn near would have won the Heisman, right? I think Caleb Williams just won it this year or just won it tonight. Um, shout out to him. But that's just give you a little background of the of what he did in two and a half years. He brought all the success to Jackson State, all the success into their football program, bringing their more notoriety, more notice um, to the university and eventually bring it to historically bad colleges, right? And 
<clears throat> so let's go to why people have been making kind of an uproar, why people have been kind of upset. Um, you know, a number of people have been upset taught in uh, from media people to regular internet folks. Um, they've been ex upset because they feel like Dion made false promises and they wanted him to stay at Jackson State even longer in order to help every HBCU school, right? But here's my thing is like, how long did people expect him to stay, right? Three years there and he brought national attention to the your, to your university. Not only to the, did he bring national attention to university, he brought it to that whole conference. Um, he brought college game day, ESPN college game day had their, you know, they, he brought them to Jackson State. They even had their own HBCU NFL combine before the NFL combine last year. Like he's doing all this um, for HBCUs in two and a half years, right? And it's just like, how long do people expect him to stay? Like you think back on your life three years ago, and how much you either have accomplished or you see a window of like what you could have accomplished. And look what Dion did in three. And, um, you know, he, he started the trend, right? Eddie George, another NFL legend, uh, former Tennessee, Tennessee Titans running back. He's coaching now at, um, at an HBCU. I don't remember what school it is. I don't, I'm gonna say Tennessee State maybe, but he's coaching at, a, at an HBCU. Uh, Mo Williams, former Minnesota Timberwolves, former K Cleveland Cavalier, um, NBA vet. He played, I know, well over 10 plus years. He's the head basketball coach at, at Jackson State. Now, is this a trickle down effect from Dion being like, hey, I'm going to go coach these, these young men um, at these universities? It has to be. It has to be because nobody was doing it. Be like no high profile names were doing it before he was right. Um, and a lot of the point that people are missing is that <clears throat> he poured a lot of his own money into the program and gave half of his salary away, right? You know, it can't, he, he brought some of the top coaches in all of college, like in all of football to come and turn the program around and the school just couldn't afford to pay them, right? You bring some of the top talent into your school, you want to be able to like pay them adequately, right? But the school just couldn't pay them. So it's like, how can I, you know, ask these guys to come and, and you know, not put their life on pause, but take your careers here. We're winning games, we're going 12 and 0, but I can't, that I can't pay you like you would be at another university. You're not going to stick around for very long, right? And some of the things that I've heard, um, some of the things that I've heard is that, oh, Coach Prime made false promises. Like, oh, he took the Colorado job strictly for financial gain and it's only about the money. Um, oh, how could he leave and do this to HBCUs? It was his duty to turn around the, the outlook on the universities and he was supposed to change all this and that and this. And it's just like, what false promises did he make, right? He brought, like I said, national attention to Jackson State and all HBCUs. Nobody outside of, like, them. Not even their alumni because they obviously weren't giving back money back to them. Um, and it's just, that's another conversation for another day. But it's just like nobody outside of HBCUs were giving, were paying attention to those schools. On a academic side, on an athletic side, like nobody besides outside of them were paying attention to those schools. And let's just keep it on football, right? Just nobody was. It's, and he brought that there. And now people are. And it's it's a well-known fact that sports, especially the game of football, has this thing to, you know, bring people together. We talk about every year. I remember when Florida Gulf Coast um, made it to the Sweet 16 in, the, in one of the tournaments, March Madness tournaments years ago. I think their enrollment went up by like our applications went up by like 750 percent because they got that national recognition on like national television right and so then people start to be like oh what's that start looking up your schools so let me apply right it's the same thing for jackson state and like the more national recognition you get through sports the more applications you get the more students you want to go to your school and that's how you get more money right it's all a, a, a it's, it's a cycle 
And like I said, nobody was paying attention to those schools outside of people that went there. And it wasn't even the alumni because that's what they wouldn't be so under underfunded if alumni were paying attention to those schools. He brought that there. Um, it can't be about the money. He's a multimillionaire. Um, he was before he got into coaching. He will be after he leaves coaching. Um, and people say it's only about the money. If it was only about the money, he wouldn't have given half his salary away to the to the institution. He wouldn't have, out of his own pocket, paid for the program to get better hotels, um, better meals for their players, better uniforms, a, a brand new locker room, all these different things, all this different stuff. People saying it's just about the money. Like, what are you? What are you not seeing here? And then for people to keep putting this on solely one person, like he's supposed to be the savior of black colleges and he was supposed to like stay here for X amount of years. Um, I just think like, man, he started it, right? He started it, now it's on everybody else to take what he elevated and elevate it even more, right? It's on us, um, it's on the alumni, it's on different athletes and pe different people with money and like to support these colleges right if you want to see them thrive now you take what he did and you build off of it because you can't just expect sorry you can't just expect one man to stay there because what happens if he leaves right what happens if he retire or decides to retire it's the same like what were you gonna what were people gonna do then what did people expect it's you take what he what he started and you build off of it for some reason like people have this crabs in a barrel mentality where it's like oh we see a person rising and wanting to do better so we just bring them down right and it's ridiculous it's ridiculous i i can't believe that there's so many people not so many people i get that i take that back but there were people that were outraged about a man doing what's best for him, his family, and just leveling up. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. I recently heard Dr. Umar. Um, Dr. Umar is a famous, I guess you want to say famous in quotations, black activist. Um, he has some really good points, but he also can be a little over the top at times. But I recently heard him on The Breakfast Club tell Charlemagne and Envy, he talked about how if Harriet Tubman decided to do, you know, a little, right? Um, she started the Underground underground Railroad and she helped bring up many of slaves, like, into freedom. He said, he was like, what if she would have stopped, right? A lot of slaves wouldn't have gotten free. And I thought this was an extremely interesting take on things because... These are just two very different scenarios, right? Obviously, obviously don't need to be pointed out, but I like I get what he was trying to say, but they're just two very different scenarios. If Harriet Tubman told a whole plantation or two, if she gave them the blueprint on how to be free, and then whatever the equivalent is to staying two and a half years of coaching, right? Let's say it's two weeks, two months, whatever it is, and she kept bringing people because I don't even know how long she did it for. So whatever in the time frame, like whatever the equivalent is to two and a half years of coaching, three years of coaching, whatever that equivalent is to leading slaves into freedom. Imagine if she would have stopped there, like after a few trips, right? Let's say after a few trips, she stopped, um, which is, is crazy to say, right? But let's say after a few trips, she stops. But at that point, she'd already given the blueprint. This is how y'all get out. This is what it is. She even guided a few. Now that's on the rest of us to, to get up out of here, right? That's on the rest of us to, to leave and follow and do and, and build off what she told us to, build off what she showed us. Um, she can't keep coming back for, for everybody. Um, and it's just like, it's the same thing with Coach Prime. He, he gave you guys a blueprint. He showed you how to do it. Yes, he's this big name with a big national spotlight before you guys got there. But he showed you guys the way now it's like build off of what he showed you don't like we can't expect one person to be our savior one person like and if that's from a hbcu standpoint right so i definitely don't have that take but you can't expect one person 
um, to do that. And it's just like either way, Coach Brian did a, an amazing job. And just like in any profession, it's time to it's time to elevate. Um, even if it was for selfish reasons, how can we be mad at him, right? How can we be mad at somebody doing what's best when it comes to their own family? Um, as uh, as a as a young man who has his own family now, I can say that I can never be mad at somebody doing what's best for your family, right? Um, even if it, let's say it's, it was for the money, more money for his kids, more money for his grandkids, uh, more generational wealth, can't be mad at it. And I think that a lot of people that didn't know sports didn't know that this happens more times than not. Like there was the famous, you know, the first speech he gave to the Colorado teams saying he's coming. And if you're not ready, get in the portal. That clip was taken out of context of him being like, oh, I'm, I'm coming here, I'm bringing my guys with me. Because right after that clip ends, he continues to go on and ask those guys like, we're bringing in tough, fast, smart players. And he goes around the room and he asks, he's like, are you that player? Are you that player? Are you that player? And they go, yes, sir, yes, sir. I was like, all right, show me. When I get back, show me. So he wasn't saying like, when I come here, like y'all better enter the portal. That's, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to weed out the weak ones, right? He wants to see who's going to be like, oh, I'm not trying to compete. Because then you don't want those guys on your team. It's like you guys went 1-11 for a reason. Of course, we, we need to bring in some new players to either raise the level of competition or raise the, the level of skill of people that are on the field. Not to mention that people are talking about him helping HBCUs and in that community. This is helping more black men get opportunities at, in head coaching and different positions within the power five, right? Um, there's been a huge lack of black head coaches within division one power five football or just division one football in general. Him doing this opens even more doors for our people, right? Him doing this helps break down, he like he helped break down barriers for HBCUs. Showed you guys that here's a blueprint, here's how to make more revenue, here's how to attract the top talent. Here you go. And now he's breaking down barriers of like helping create more opportunities for black men to get these positions of head coach, defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator. If he like goes on to succeed at the power five level. And it's something that like, I just don't understand how you can be mad at coach prime for doing all these great things. And it's just like, oh no, we wanted you to stay here. No, we wanted you to stay right here for 20 years. Don't leave. And when you leave, it's thank you, right? Which makes zero sense. So while we're on the topic of college football, let's talk about the transfer portal, right? Let's talk about the portal. Everybody expected that this to be the, the thing, right? When the transfer portal became a thing, um, when the NIL became a thing, like I think this is the craziest we've ever seen the transfer portal, um, especially in recent years. Um, since when I got to college in 2015, it was fall 2015. Like I said, when I transferred out of, out of St. Cloud for the first time, it wasn't as easy as this process is, where you're just like, hey, I'm, I'm leaving, thank you. Um, it was definitely easier than it was in previous generations, but it wasn't like this, like this wasn't a portal. And then by the time I was able to transfer again from Mankato, I think the portal had just become a thing. Um, And... I just think it has a different meaning than it did even a few years ago. And I don't know if that's because of the NIL thing. I don't know if it's because this new generation of kids are coming in and they feel they, like the social media age of, of feeling entitled to things like, oh, you want the stardom and the, and the this and the that right away. I don't know what it is, but it just doesn't have the same meaning it did. And I'm, I'm going to sound like an old head uh, right now, but that's fine. It doesn't have the same meaning it did when I was transferring, right, a few years ago. Kids are now entering the transfer portal after one year, right? After a year, and they're like, if they're not playing or not starting, they're just entering the portal. Um, and there's no more trying to earn a spot. There's no more trying to compete. It seems like for some of these kids, I'm gonna say for some, because it's like most of them are transferring for great reasons. So I, I should have started there. Most of them are transferring for great reasons. But some of these kids, there's no more, like, they just don't have that dog in them anymore, right? 
And like I said, this is coming from somebody that's transferred multiple times. Use the transfer portal. It benefited me so I can never talk bad about it. Um, I agree a wholeheartedly 100% that players should be able to transfer just like coaches can accept other jobs, right? Just like they can up and leave to accept another job, I feel like a player should be able to enter the portal and leave. But I do see why there's a reason why you can't just, like, I mean, I guess you can not leave and go somewhere else and play right away. Like, there's no, before, like, my first time transferring, there was that rule. But now you can just go anywhere and play right away. But um, some kids are only transferring, right? because they think that the grass is greener on the other side when most of the time it's the exact opposite. I see it so much. We've seen it so much. Um, I think playing Division II football gave me such a, a, a great experience, right? Playing Division II football and having the opportunity to play professional football means that you play at this level where people don't, like, people don't think of it as college football players know that it's like, you, if you are able to play college football, you're blessed at any level it's it's high level football but the masses don't think oh it's not high level football because it's not on national tv the best players don't go there um but playing at that level and having the opportunity to play pro football where there's guys that played in the nfl there's guys that played big time d1 football and you're like oh like i'm better than this guy i'm better than this guy i can play with you but i also play division two football like, i think it's a it's a great position to be in because you realize that at the end of the day it's just football right um some kids just get like obviously their kids are better bigger but sometimes it's just about opportunity that you get and i bring that up to say that a lot of the times you see division one transfers transfer down to the d2 level and guess what they don't play they think like people think like, oh, you're coming from this school. Like this guy's supposed to be really good. And you're like, oh my gosh, you're not even better than our, what? Like your second string, you're not even better than like, and it's crazy when you see that for the first few times and you really realize you're like, man, the guys that you watch on Saturdays on national TV, like you're just as good as them. Um, so that makes me to bring, that leads me to my point of like the grass isn't always greener. Guys think they can transfer and oh, it's gonna be better over here. Well, like most of the time, it's it's not because you got to be able to put in the work. Like if you're if you can ball, you can ball. And that's why I say that sometimes you realize that it's just not the right fit, right? It's just not the right fit for you, for your school, uh, for your for your family. And you're like, uh, maybe I don't fit into the offense, right? Uh, that was my problem at Mankato. Spent three years there, three years there, competed for two, like earned a starting spot. Um, eventually lost my starting spot after I got hurt. And then that's why I ended up transferring. I didn't just leave after one year. I spent three years competing, right? Trying to earn my spot. And and that's why I say like, that's why I feel obligated. And I can talk on this because yes, I transferred. But it wasn't after a year. It wasn't after a year. And it wasn't like some of these kids that are just like, oh, I'm not playing right away. I'm leaving. It's like, nah, you get, compete, man. Like, wherever you go there you are right um we're gonna talk about that a little later but you know like i said sometimes it's just not the right fit that's totally understandable sometimes people and players have great seasons and they want to bet on themselves i just saw a player from sioux falls division two school up here in the midwest um get an offer from university of minnesota right balled out as a true freshman got an offer sometimes they want to bet on themselves and see if they can go to a better school can never be mad at that never met at a player that wants to bet on themselves and with the new nil nil the bigger names within college football they want to see where the finance well, they want to see where their money's at right they want to see where the financials side of things are at and you can never be mad at someone trying to get their bread right that just is what it is but if you're a kid who's transferring because you aren't getting the tick that you want you're not getting the playing time that you believe you deserve Man, you gotta look in the mirror first. You have to look in the mirror first and foremost and ask yourself, like, man, am I doing everything I can to succeed, right? You gotta ask yourself, like, why is it why am I not playing? Um, like I said, have I been have I been putting myself in the best position to succeed? Have I been putting myself in the best position possible to to thrive? Or like simply have I been bullshitting this whole time? You see a ton, a ton with kids that come in and out of, of colleges. <laughs> 
you know, want to drink and party more than they want to study. They want to go out and chase these women more than they want to, like, work out and do this and that. It's just like, man, you can't, like, leaving and going to another school, <laughs> wherever you go, there you are, right? So if you're a hard worker, you study, you do the right things, it's just not the right fit for you, you're going to take those qualities and it's going to lead you to your next school. But man, if you're lazy, if you're bullshitting, if you're arguing with the coaches, if you're not coachable, that's going to go to the next school too. And those same reasons why you didn't, like if those are the reasons why you didn't play at this school, then the same reasons why you don't play at, the, at this next school, right? Um, just because you're changing schools, it's not going to change your laziness, right? Just because you're changing schools, it's not going to change your lack of detail. It's not going to change your unwillingness to listen or be coachable. That's, these are this is what I mean by looking in the mirror and asking yourself, am I doing everything I possibly can to put myself in a position to succeed? If it's a no, then you gotta then you gotta get yourself right before really being like, okay, it's time to time to up and leave. But if it's a if it's a yes, I'm doing everything, then by all means, man, use the portal like it's supposed to be used and take that opportunity to better yourself and find the right fit for you. But man, like I said. Some of these dudes, some of these kids now just don't want to compete and got that dog in them. And I, and I saw a great tweet the other day, like, man, if you get to the NFL, if the NFL is your dream and you get there, you can't just up and leave the team, right, that you want to. Um, if you want to, you got to be able to compete. I, it's funny, I just listened to Clinton Porter's old running back for the Washington Redskins. Um, he talked about how at Miami, before him, it was Edger and James, Hall of Famer. Then he came, rushed for 10,000 yards in the NFL. Like at University of Miami, it was Edder and James, and it was Clinton Porters, then it was Willis McGahee, and after that, it was Frank Gore. Like they all waited their turn, they all competed. And I mean, you look at it with the Bama, the quarterbacks they just had back in 2017, 2016. It was Jalen Hurts, then Tua. Tua waited his turn, got his spot. Then it was Mac Jones. Mac Jones waited his turn, got his opportunity. Man, now they're all three starting NFL quarterbacks, and it's just like sometimes, man, you gotta, you gotta just ride it out. You gotta compete. And you gotta ask yourself, am I doing everything I possibly can? And just look for the light at the end of the tunnel. If it's there, keep going. If it's not, and you've been doing everything possible, then it's time to bounce. Then it's time to leave and find that fit for you. But man. Nah. Episode 56, I believe. I, I believe it is. You made this far, man. Appreciate y'all tapping into another episode of the Vance Barnes Pod. Until next time, peace.